So I've been with MSF for over four years now. Um, what I should say in advance is that my uh, career path in MSF is not a typical one. Um, I'd started out as an intern and have taken lots of different positions. But what then I can give you is a kind of broader perspective of then the different non-medical positions in the field, but also um, what's it really like in the, the field. So I'll try to make it personal. Um, and yeah, any questions that you have at the end, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so the first thing that I usually get asked when people say, oh, so you're working for MSF is, oh, so you're a doctor. And then I always disappoint them by saying no. Um, so the thing though is with MSF is that at least 50% of all of our positions in the field are non-medical. So we employ quite a wide range as well. So we have logisticians, we have people working on finance, on HR. Then we have people working with advocacy. So speaking out um, on behalf of the populations that we um, are working for. Um, communication and also health promoters. So working within the communities to see um, how can we encourage people, for example, to use uh, mosquito nets or to um, you know do proper hygiene to avoid and um, you know diarrhea or uh, other outbreaks. So my missions. Um, so as I said, then I've not had a typical career path, um, but I have been to. Uh, some of the like bigger MSF missions that are English speaking. So um, South Sudan, Tanzania and Sierra Leone. So I'll tell you a little bit about just what those missions entailed. And when I say mission, it's um, that's the word in MSF that we give to the uh, activities that we have in a country. And then your um, time in that country is your mission. So. South Sudan. Um, South Sudan is probably one of our uh, biggest uh, like operations. Um, we have all of the offices across MSF actually present in the country. And in South Sudan, then I was the interim commerce manager. So that meant that then I did all of the communications for then the five offices. And then um, speaking out about violence against civilians, about malaria, um, about the um, people fleeing within the country, living in protection of uh, civilian camps, and uh, yeah, just trying to to address the massive uh, health concerns within the, the country. So then I was based in Juba, in the capital, and then um, usually in this position, then you would do frequent travel to the projects. So then here you can see just some of them listed so across the country and while I was there then I helped with a press release for the international president Joanne so that's her in the bottom picture there um, and MSF has been in the country for over 20 years so our operations are very well established there. Um, thereafter I went to Tanzania and this uh, project that we worked on it was for water and sanitation so then we were building a water um, system within the camp so that people would be able to access enough water to you know uh, be able to wash their clothes to be able to drink to be able to cook um, for them the basics and this was um, Burundi refugees fleeing into Tanzania and there are several camps in the country so you had Nirangusu and Duta um, and then we had Mtendeli which then was the the newest one and oh sorry in uh, Tanzania, then there I was responsible for um, HR, for finance and for logistical supply. So making sure that then, you know, our national staff are paid, that they have contracts, for making sure that then all of our banking and accounting is in order, and then also to organize supplies. And because it was a big construction project, you're doing things like ordering pumps, uh, going to the local supplier to buy pipes, um, you know, ensuring that deliveries are made, that cargo is offloaded, um, things like that. Then my last mission was in Sierra Leone, and there I was what MSF calls a humanitarian affairs officer. That essentially means that then I do advocacy for the country, so speaking out then for the population. And here the focus is maternal and child health care. 
Um, Sierra Leone actually has one of the highest um, maternal and child mortality rates worldwide. And MSF, um, I'm sure most of you probably know, we had a very large presence there during Ebola. But then um, after Ebola, we realized that the health system was still completely incapable of being able to provide proper care and access to care for this population. So while I was here, I was based in the capital in Freetown. And then I was um, responsible for all of the offices and um, ensuring that then there was a proper strategy in place, that we had the right connections with the other um, NGOs, with the government, with the local communities. And then um, to make sure that then all of our advocacy aims are rooted in our operations. So how can we improve access to care for mothers? Um, how can we ensure that you know, children aren't dying before the age of five for very uh, treatable things like uh, malaria or diarrhea. So actually in this picture here is one of the pediatric doctors um, who was then, this is a child who was uh, originally in the Magburaka hospital. So this is during lunchtime. Okay, so um, I'll focus most of my presentation then just on what's it like in the, the field and how I felt going to the field. But then of course, during the questions, then I can go into more in terms of the positions themselves. So uh, pre-departure nerves. Uh, I think because I'd already been in the office, I already had quite a good understanding of what is it to be in the field with MSF. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't uh, nervous to, to go. So the first thing for me was security. Less for me because I know that MSF is really excellent when it comes to ensuring that we're safe. You have curfews, you travel by land cruiser, you report your movements, everything is very, uh, you're very much uh, babysat while you're in the mission. Um, but I still obviously had a family at home who were then worried. And my first mission being South Sudan, um, uh, yeah, my my mum, I banned her from Googling uh, the country. I'm sure she probably still did. Um, so yeah, there you have to, to balance that right in terms of your family back home. Um, I was worried about my performance. How would I function in the field in a completely different environment, um, in a different culture, and, uh, you know, doing tasks that I'd maybe not done before as well. Um, the other like big concern is, of course, your family and loved ones back home, because when you go to the field, you're there for a set amount of time. Um, and yeah, you think, what if then I like miss everyone? What if then, uh, you know, you miss out on important events, weddings, births, so on. So it was another concern. And then communication, being able to stay in touch when the Internet connection isn't so great. And then an embarrassing one, but I was worried about uh, latrines and, you know, showering in a bucket and how would I cope, even though I like to think that I'm quite outdoorsy, but what would that be like uh, over a longer period of time? So, um, yeah, before I went as well, I had no idea what it would be like in an office, like what was the environment, what's the setup? And what I should say is that every mission is different. Um, and every work environment is different and also depends on your position. So here I put some photos just to kind of show the different uh, work environments that I had. So um, the one on the top left, uh, this is from a um, trip with then the emergency response unit conducting surveillance in Sierra Leone. And then it was a boat trip to one of the islands, so one of the nicer uh, work settings. And I yeah, it looks pretty idyllic. Then we also did um, outreach in the community. So with the land cruiser, then we go to the villages and you meet with the, um, the people living there. Also in urban settings, um, I spent time within the, the slums in Sierra Leone, going around, going to the clinics. This is actually from this picture here, visiting the local health workers to see what are their needs what are their challenges? How can MSF support them? Who can we speak to to try and improve the you know, supply of drugs or training of their staff? And then uh, this one here in the bottom at the middle, uh, this was our office in Tanzania. So very basic structure, not so great when it was windy or rainy. Um, and you have papers flying everywhere, but generally very nice during the dry season. 
but it was quite basic. We were in the field, it was an emergency project. Um, it meant that we weren't going to have like a, a firm kind of structure there. But most of the time you'll be in a office building that's not too unlike buildings that you have anywhere. And it's, it's just generally that it's warmer, uh, depending on where you go, more humid, more bugs, things like that. Um, so housing. So again, every mission was very different. So when I went to South Sudan, I really expected that I would be having very basic accommodation. Um, and I arrived and I had a four poster bed. I had my own bathroom. I had air conditioning. We had a roof terrace. Um, where we even made our own little MSF bar and we would sit at night and it was very nice. Um, and then in Tanzania, I was in a bamboo hut, um, which was actually very nice and I really liked that. It was probably my favourite room. And then in Sierra Leone, I was in this fancy house with uh, this view here. This is where I would eat my breakfast and uh, even with one direction on my, on my bed. So <laughs> yeah, this, this is my favourite bedspread from the, the cleaners. Um, so lots of the time you'll have your own room, but sometimes you'll need to share and sometimes you might be in a tent. Um, but a lot of the time, and especially in the capital, you'll be in a pretty nice, nice house. Definitely the house in South Sudan was nicer than my own apartment. So. And on top of that, you have cooks and you have cleaners. So you're not doing your own washing. Um, and I think that probably it's made me a bit of a terrible adult when I return. It's a... Uh, an adjustment to do my dishes. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of like, yeah, washing and uh, the latrines in Tanzania, that's a picture of the latrine. We had a VIP latrine it's called, which just basically means it's really dark to stop flies. So a uh, head torch was a must. And I have to say it was probably one of my biggest uh, concerns before I left. But by the end, I would definitely choose a latrine over a Western toilet. But then I have been told that because it's a water and sanitation project that we had a very nice one. Um, so sometimes they're not as nice as the one that we had. And the same for, for washing. Sometimes you'll have like a bucket on the ground. Maybe you have a really great log who lifts that bucket and puts holes in it so that you can have like a shower. Or maybe you even live in a house which has like, yeah, a proper bathroom like you would do here. Most of the time though, so, uh, hot water isn't really uh, available, so cold showers, but then it's a hot climate anyway, right? Um, and these were actually really nice. The ones on the top, there are two cools that were in the, one of the Sierra Leonean projects. So they were very, very lovely. It felt like um, quite like a nice like Airbnb location or, yeah. Okay, so um, team life and security and how you deal with the stress and pressures in the field. So. The first thing with MSF is that uh, in almost every project that you would work in, you will live with your teammates. So you work together, you don't uh, sleep maybe in the same room, but sometimes you might. You eat together, you're always there. Um, so of course, having a well-functioning team is really important, not only for you socially, but also then for your work. So how do you, how do you deal with this? Um, I think it's important to say that investing in team life is probably one of the best things that you can do. Um, and everyone has a role to contribute. And when you have a well-functioning team, I think it's one of the, the best things. So we would, for example, I was in Sierra Leone during Christmas and one of the staff members organized Secret Santa. Another one bought a goat to then barbecue. Uh, not so great for me as a vegetarian, but still very nice. Um, Someone else organized uh, cake from their home country. Someone else cooked another traditional dish. We had music um, and we had this celebration all together. And, you know, you become each other's family. Um, we even sometimes you'll be in projects where you'll have pets. Uh, not always. Quite often it's to stop rats. Uh, but then we had this really nice little, it's like a miniature antelope called Yoni who then lived in the compound in Sierra Leone and uh, she loved mangoes. So she was very, very tiny, probably about like this high. Um, one thing that I found really helped was uh, exercising in the field because quite often you're driven everywhere. So, you know, the Land Cruiser picks you up at the office, will take you to your meeting 
and you're not really using your legs so much, you're not really walking around. And I think that after a while, it uh, probably comes quite evident also in my um, body that then I've not been doing any exercise, but I think it's also great in terms of stress release and also for bonding with your teammates. So one thing which I heard is very typical with an MSF generally is this uh, workout called Insanity. So we would do that uh, early in the morning in the laundry area. Um, other places I've done yoga and um, people go running. It depends a little bit on your, your team. Um, and then, yeah, we would have parties. So parties with the national staff or parties in our own compound where you would invite other organizations or like other MSF offices. So the one with the makeup was for an 80s party that we had in, uh, in Tanzania. And then you also become uh, quite creative with your entertainment when you're kind of locked down. So Tanzania, we had a curfew so that after 6 p.m. we couldn't leave our base. So we were a small team, around eight to 10 people. Um, and we were then together every night, every day, and uh, with not really much to do round about. So here we created a ping pong table in the dining hall. We would have movie nights where we used bed sheets and projector. Um, we would do foot spas with our buckets. Um, yeah, you just find different ways of being creative, but I would say I didn't miss uh, the things that I thought I would miss in terms of like, you know, being able to go to the movies or go and party or like, you know, go out for dinner because I think generally within your team, it's pretty good and you can play board games and yeah, you become very creative, I think. And yeah, the thing within the curfews is that, uh, and that's why I have like the land cruisers, is that then sometimes it can feel quite uh, small, the world that you live in. But I also think it's a little bit of uh, what you, you make of it. Um, okay, so other things in expat life. So one of my favorite things about working in the field is the national staff. I think the national staff are just really fantastic, um, depending on the project that you're in. Some of them will have been there already for like 10 years more. They'll have so much experience. Um, they get very excited about when you have traditional dress on. So this is generally when you leave a project, um, the kind of tradition is that you'll get something made. So this is one of my colleagues with a Sierra Leone and outfit on. And then the cleaner's very excited to, to see her in it. Maybe not something she'll wear back in Canada, but. Um, and then, uh, Food. So, as I said, I'm vegetarian, so lots of places that MSF is based, it's maybe not the, the easiest. On the left is the more exciting meal that I had in Tanzania, which is basically an omelette with uh, fries inside. And uh, I would have that with a soda as a special treat. Um, and then pretty much every other day I had beans and rice. So beans went from being one of my favorite foods to one of my least favorite by the end of my, my missions. Um, but it really depends on where you are. Like if you're in the capital, it's usually quite easy to be able to get like, you know, fresh produce or even some Western food. So in uh, Freetown, I even found corn burgers. So. Then the other thing is, uh, yeah, getting sick. It's, I would say because you become such a family, it's also that you have a very caring atmosphere, but it also I've, uh, I quickly recognize that everyone, everyone knows when you have diarrhea or everyone knows when you're, you're ill. So there's, there's no secrets <laughs> and it becomes very normal. My friend joked and said that it's never a um, humanitarian dinner unless someone's talking about diarrhea. So, uh, <laughs> so I had plenty of uh, checks to see if I had malaria, um, but then you also always have someone who is responsible for expat health. So this is, lovely Dutch colleague Bono um, demonstrating with the stethoscope before he was going to check to see if I had TB. Um, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, so anyway, they're very thorough. So I mean, anytime that you're ill, they will go and check through like everything that possibly could be to make sure that you're taken care of. And in the very worst case, you can be flown back home or flown to a, you know, a really great hospital luxury that say, our national staff don't have. So you're you're in very much uh, safe hands being with the medical organization. Okay, so the worst bits. Um, one of the things that I struggled the most with in the field 
is the systems that, um, of the country that I'm in. For example, in Sierra Leone, um, they have all of the possibility to be a very uh, well-functioning country, to be able to invest in their health systems, to be able to make changes, but corruption is so much of an issue that then in reality things aren't really done or things are done in a very slow way. And in Tanzania, there was also similar issues. This picture is actually when we were arrested um, because they wanted to get some bribe money. So we were taken to uh, a small building and then interrogated for a while before then we were released. But as you can see, no one's particularly concerned. Again, MSF is very uh, great at supporting you. Exactly. I mean, we were being interrogated with like chickens running around um, and <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, the you know that was frustrating because it meant that this day we weren't able to finish our operations in the in the camp um, to make sure that there was enough water there. So you have things like this where then it also takes slower. It's not the same as here where then you can you know you expect a service to be delivered quite quickly or that uh, it wouldn't necessarily be too bureaucratic. Well, then, you know, I waited, I think, like two months to be able to get a pump into the country just to be able to make our well function. So it can be hard not to be frustrated, but I think as long as you channel that frustration into being productive and trying to function as a team for like, OK, how can we address these issues? How can we make sure that we still um, are able to, you know, make sure that people have access to care, that they have water, that they have shelter? Um, the other thing, well, for me, but I mean, it depends on the person. Um, the food I miss a lot from home, but particularly cheese. Dairy's not really uh, been a, a big thing in the places that I've lived, although there was a local Tanzanian cheese that was okay. Um, but it's something which then I struggled with. So, as I said, like four months of beans and rice every day uh, takes its toll, um, but I, I still. Yeah, it's still not the the end of the world, but it's maybe like one downside. And uh, as you can probably tell, I'm Scottish, so the heat <laughs> isn't really my, my friend. So I think I spend probably like 90% of my time in the field just like sweating profusely. Um, so that also takes some getting used to. Then also communication. It depends really where you are. Lots of places there will be really great internet. National staff will have smartphones um, and they'll be, you know, WhatsApping and communicating. It's, it's fine, but sometimes you'll be places where then you're not really able to get service or that you might need to use um, like satellite to be able to get internet and then it's for work purposes. So it can be hard. I mean, trying to, to have a conversation with someone back home when it keeps cutting out or there's a long delay, but you, you make it work. And then the other bit is then, yeah, the goodbyes. Um, I would say that one of the nicest things which I'll come to then is you know having this team but of course everyone's there for a short amount of time so you frequently have to say goodbye both to then your uh, expatriate staff but then the national staff when you leave as well but the best bits so as I said the team so yeah for me it's one of the best things about being in the in the field is having a group of people who all have the same commitment to the organization, incredible experience and knowledge, um, different cultural backgrounds. And that to me is a really, uh, a very uh, great part of and privilege of then being with MSF. We recruit from all over the world. And sometimes you'll have even um, local staff who will then also um, be in your team and living with you too. Um, and yeah, as I said, the national staff. So this is actually, these are my uh, cleaners and cooks from Tanzania. They, they really love to be fashionable. So they were pretty excited. This was my, my last day I was taking them out for food. So they came and they had, uh, at first they came in like jeans and a t-shirt and I thought oh, it's not really like them because they'd always have like ball gowns on to like clean the latrines. And then I came round and then they'd done pruning. Um, the girl at the front bending over had bought a new wig um, and then they did the like fashion parade. Um, so yeah, it's working with, with the national staff and building that relationship. And as I said, uh, most of the time they're far more experienced and knowledgeable than you will be. 
So you have a lot to learn from them. Um, and then our work, of course. I mean, being able to see the, the impact of our work, seeing how then the population are able to benefit from that. You know, whether it's you know, a mother who might have died in childbirth or that her child ordinarily would no longer be with us just because, you know, didn't have access to, to simple, um, to like medication or even just to, yeah, basic nutrition. So for me, that's, I mean, that's the reason first and foremost why I'm with MSF is our work. And then an added bonus is that you get to travel. I mean, uh, everyone joked when I went to Sierra Leone that then I have a holiday mission because this is one of the beaches. Um, so this is where I would get to spend weekends and to be in such a beautiful country is um, quite, a, quite a privilege. But I should say that not every place looks like Sierra Leone um, and where I was in Tanzania, it was very dusty. But yeah, you get to experience new culture, new places and travel to locations that you might ordinarily never go to. So uh, what's it like to return home? I think with time it starts to become easier, the transition between your kind of personal life and MSF life. But then I think the biggest thing for me is that I thought that I would have a cultural shock arriving in the country, when really I think it's more when you actually come back. So I went there expecting everything to be different and expected to come home and for everything to be the same. But really that's not the, the case. When you're in the field, depending on where you're based, maybe the only people that you really see are other MSFers. You live in this bubble where then you talk about work during the evening and you all share the same same passion and same like interest in terms of uh, what we're doing there. And then it can feel a little bit like your reality in the field is completely separate to your reality back home. I think at some points I almost felt like there was two versions of me, one that was still back. Um, in Europe and then the other one that was in the field. And when you return, you do have this kind of adjustment period. One of the things that they'll say to you um, in, the, in your training before you go is that often when you come back home, it can be quite hard to share your experiences with loved ones. And for me, I always thought, oh, it's because there may be like potentially traumatic experiences. And I'm not medical. So I don't have that uh, connection with the, the patients where I maybe see the same things that, like doctors or nurses do. But for me, it was actually that people aren't really able to relate to the work that you're doing. They don't really have an idea of what you're doing. So they don't really ask. Or when they do, it's, did you have a good time? And then the conversation ends, which I found quite difficult because then it's almost like this part of your life didn't really exist. And how do you reconcile the two? But it varies person to person, depending on their interest level as well. And when I'd asked some of my friends about it, they had just said, oh, it's because the work that you do is so incredible and you're there saving children. But her image of me, you know, saving children is far from the truth. I mean, I go to an office, like I go to the office here and I, you know, do my work and I eat beans and rice and I come home. It's not uh, maybe how the, the way the media portrays uh, humanitarian life. So I think that's important to be able to share your experiences and be forthcoming about them, but also to recognize that not everyone will necessarily understand. Um, but then the great things about being home is cheese. I had uh, all these Netflix shows to catch up on. I think I spent the first week in my pajamas. Um, hot showers. I've never been so excited for a hot shower. Um, and then, you know, the convenience that you have back home. The first time I went to the supermarket after Tanzania because it was very rural, I was so overwhelmed by the choice and the fact that everyone was white, <laughs> that I had, had a little meltdown. I was like, oh, <laughs> ended up leaving the shop with nothing at all. Um, but that's, yeah, you really take it for granted when you're back home, but it's nice to return to. And then most importantly, so like loved ones, being able to see them. And actually the reality was not so much that I missed them. Probably for them, it was a little bit more that they missed me because their life is kind of the same, except that I'm not there. But while you're there, you're so absorbed in the work that you're doing that time passes very quickly, generally. And uh, 
I kind of felt that no time had really passed at all. Um, but obviously very nice to be able to, to see everyone and, and catch up. So what did I learn from my experiences with MSF? First of all, every mission is different. Um, I don't think that there's any two that are necessarily alike. And that's also because every team is different. Um, our operations change. And yeah, you, I think that then it's just important then to keep in mind that maybe if you hear that one person had one experience, that that won't necessarily be your experience and every person is different and they will, uh, everyone will have a different opinion from, from each context. Then the national staff expertise. I already knew before how important national staff are to MSF, but I just found it really incredible. For example, um, we had to, to do construction in the camp in Tanzania and we weren't able to get through because there was all the, the bush um, and then there was also this river and we were waiting for the UN because they said that they were going to, to fix everything. And then we waited a couple of weeks and then we grew impatient and then one of the staff, um, William, who will actually now become an uh, expatriate, he said, don't worry, I have it. He recruited, um, I think, like 200 daily workers. Everyone came, they cut through the, the bush, and then he built this bridge, which definitely wouldn't be uh, up to like health and safety standards, but of wood, and we were able to get the crane across. And then after that, which was just incredible to see, we had, I think, like a, a mile of uh, pipeline, maybe a little bit more, with daily workers carrying it through the camp like this huge snake, and we're able then to, to create a whole network in the camp in just a matter of days, something which I don't think would ever be possible here, and that's because of their specific expertise. Um, then the other thing is patience. As I said, the systems can often be uh, trying, that it can be difficult sometimes to not be pessimistic, but I think you always need to retain your optimism that then things can change and be patient that then it's just not maybe happening at the pace that you would like it to or that it would happen back home. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, I really thought that I would feel such a culture shock when I arrived in these countries, but I actually realized that people are people everywhere. Um, people have the same concerns, uh, you know, the same wishes, the same dreams, and it's really not that big of a, a change. I mean, of course, there are different like cultural norms, for example, in Tanzania, then for hierarchy, then they avoid eye contact. But, you know, when you get to know someone, it's, uh, it's really no different. And then, um, yeah, the importance of expat life. I think one of the reasons why I love the Tanzanian project so much is just because there was so much effort put in by everyone in the team to make sure that then, you know, we did things together, we would as I said, there wasn't much for entertainment, but we would have bonfires or that we, like if it was someone's birthday, we would bake a cake and we would really make an effort. Um, and that makes a big difference because it helps to relieve stress, but also means you work better together as well. So most importantly, why would I recommend MSF to you? So first and foremost, I just think that our work, um, MSF is one of the biggest emergency organizations there are. We're very privileged because we are independently financed. So we're not dependent on donors or governments to say, okay, well, you can only work here and you can only work under these conditions. We can say, here there is an emergency. We want to go there. This is what we plan to do. And we can be there very quickly. And having that independence means that then quite often our interventions then are better suited to the needs of the population. And I think that that's quite an incredible thing to have as an organization. Um, the people, so as I said, getting to work with so many amazing staff, both national and expatriate. Um, and yeah, and you, you broaden your understanding and your skill set. Quite often you'll have quite a lot more responsibility that you might have back home. So yeah, you're thrown a little bit into the deep end and you're put into an environment where you don't necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily familiar with, but you become more resourceful for it. And I think that then you, yeah, you grow quite a lot because of that. So it's a, it's a very uh, selfish thing, I guess, but it's, uh, 
yeah, you, I think you stand to benefit a lot from, from the experience. Yeah, and then uh, expanding networks. I mean, lots of the people that I've worked with then I'm still in touch with, we go traveling together, we meet up, um, you'll attend weddings or births or other events. And that to me is pretty nice to have a, an MSF family um, across the world. So I think that that's, yeah, that's my presentation. So if you have any uh, questions. Uh, how much would you work? I mean, would you have like one day off a week or something? Or sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, how much did you work? Did you have one day off a week or what? So, <laughs> is it working okay? Yeah. Um, so, it very much depends on the, the mission. So in Tanzania, it was an emergency, but generally for emergencies, you're there for a shorter period of time. And some days I would work from seven in the morning till 11 at night. And I generally worked most days, but Sundays were meant to be the day off. Sometimes I very much respected that, but other times I would still do work. Sierra Leone, on the other hand, it was a regular mission and I did Monday to Friday and I had the weekends off. It's, um, it's more depends on the work that's needed to be done at the time. And sometimes it will be very busy and other times it will be quieter. And I think that's one thing which then your manager will then make sure of that, okay, we recognize that just now it's busier so everyone will give, give it everything, but then we will take a bit of a break or you will have a kind of R&R &R afterwards. But yeah, you, you work more than you would do back home, but it is for a set period of time and then you have a, a rest. <coughs> So Tanzania, I was there for four months, South Sudan, just two, and then Sierra Leone, six months. But again, my experience isn't necessarily uh, the norm. Generally, it's between six and nine months for a mission, unless you're doing emergencies, and emergencies are more when you're more experienced. And then sometimes they could even just be for like six weeks. Um, but for non-medical positions, it's important for the project to have that continuity and for the staff, because if there's a different manager every other month, then obviously it makes it difficult for them. So I would say the average length is between six and nine months, and sometimes you also have ones for, for a year. <laughs> Many questions. <laughs> and when uh, one mission is over, do you go home and then you can go back out again, or do you go from one place to another, or, or what? Again, it depends. Um, I like to take a break in between because I just think then I'll arrive with more energy when I go back out to the field. And I also think that that's, that's important not only for myself, but also for, for the project. Um, generally, I would say most people take a, like a couple of months at least mm -hmm. in between. But then maybe you work in an emergency and then you're only there for a short period of time and then you feel ready to go somewhere else. It's, but it's always dependent on you. So once you finish a mission, you will then be in touch with your, your manager for in, the, in the office, so whether it's like Sweden or elsewhere, and they will say to you, when are you ready to go back out to the field? And then you can tell them. So maybe it's a year from now, two years from now, or maybe it's in a couple of months, but that's set by you. Okay. Which kind of medical staff? What kind of medical staff? Ah, which kind of medical staff? So medical staff, perhaps in Eugene, we'll go a bit more into, but then you have uh, a broad range. I mean, from surgeons, anaesthetists, doctors, nurses. Laboratory. Yeah, laboratory. You, you, have, you really have everything. And it depends on the mission. Sometimes there might be a specific need for more kind of specialist or technical um, medical positions. Um, other times it might be, you know, related just to tropical medicine or then maybe like TB, neglected diseases. It really varies in the context, but as a medical person, I think that you can always be, be placed. Um, but yeah, Yuzhan can explain a bit more after. It's only um, uh, single people or it can be with families? I mean families. Yeah. So um, in the projects that I've been, or the missions that I've been in, in Sierra Leone, there were a few families there. Generally, this, 
it's only when you've been with MSF for a while um, because then you have that, that experience, but then there are some circumstances where you, you know, it might be someone who's in their first mission. Um, but it's always in context where it's possible to have a family, so like that there is like an international school, um, that then it's safe enough of a, a context. Quite often you do have um, MSF couples who are there with their family, so Ethiopia, the head of mission, who's like the top manager, and the medical coordinator are married with two kids. And in Addis, you have a very like normal life. I mean, there's a cinema there, there's shopping malls and stuff like that. So it is, it is possible, but I would say the options of where you go are more limited and it will generally be in the capital, so in the coordination, which is why it's more experienced uh, staff. And they are priority uh, in the conditions, the families, the children and... Uh, so when you're with a f in a family mission, you'll generally have your own own house but again it's again for coordination when you're higher up it might be more likely that you have your own um, own accommodation but again it's in the capital when you're in the field it's very much that it's communal so it's not really so suitable than for for having a family necessarily but it very much depends on the context and if you were to be recruited and then for you know that they would be able to take that into consideration and see whether it's feasible <laughs> yes, sir. Um, French as a country, how important is that? Or if you don't have it, it's that yeah, break um, it or not? So I don't have French, which is why I've been to all of these English speaking missions. And it, it is true that they want French because then you're more easily placed. But I do know a lot of people in MSF who don't have good French or have non-existent French. Um, so for example, the Amsterdam office, they have a lot of English speaking missions. So you have places like Myanmar or Malawi, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, South Sudan. South Sudan is pretty much anywhere. You know, if you don't speak uh, French, that's your punishment, then you go keep going back to South Sudan. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, I think it would depend a little bit on your, your skill set, but I, maybe Eugène can go a little bit more into that, but I, I know that exceptions are made, so I wouldn't say don't apply because of it, um, because I'm proof that you can be in the field. Um, but I have been told all the time, you need your French, so I'm working on it, I promise. <laughs> I will keep this for a while now. <laughs> so uh, what work experience did you have from back home? Okay, yeah, sorry, I should have said. so. Um, my undergrad was law, so I studied law in Scotland. And then afterwards I went to Uppsala mm. to do the Peace and Conflict Masters, so international relations. And then from there I had an internship at the MSF office and I thought, oh, I'll see what it's like with MSF, thinking I wanted to join the UN. And then I think after a couple of weeks I decided that I didn't like the UN anymore um, because they're too bureaucratic and mm. uh, very much um, drinking from the Kool-Aid with MSF and decided this is where I want to be. So <coughs> from there then I've worked in like different positions within the office doing some administration and then I uh, finally got my break to the field because in MSF that's the most important thing is having your field experience so that was South Sudan mm -hmm. and then after I had that then I've I've moved around but again it's it's not typical for you to go from you know communications manager to then logistics manager, to then humanitarian affairs, you would generally be tracked. So for me, my profile is humanitarian affairs because generally it's a legal or political science background. You know, you're doing analysis and reporting, um, trying to strategize for that country. Uh, but yeah, if you generally, then I would say if you have a strong like administrative background or you have a background in kind of research that you, those are two positions, like, or even for like um, in terms of health promotion, lots of people who do like masters in public health who are not medical end up to do health promotion in the field. So it's it's very much person dependent, but um, yeah, having a degree, having French is great, and I think it's like two years minimum work experience. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when you sign up, uh, I guess you needed to be available for twelve months, but when you do get a mission. 
will you know from the beginning this is three months or this is six months or nine months or, or yeah so before you go um the way that it works is that and um, for example so my hr person in the uk like hayley will send me an email and say hey we have availability we have a space in this mission here to do this position and um, the commitment that they're looking for is this period of time mm. would you be available and she will be looking in relation to what i've said to her so i will have said to her hey i'm available from june i can do like six months um you know and then they will place you but most of the time at the start it's they will place you where there's a need so it's not yeah. that you say oh i want to go and work in myanmar i want to be in sierra leone but it's clear from the start and you can extend mm. and things do change um, depending on the the context but yeah that's that's set out so you can plan so that was my next <laughs> next question uh if you can actually have a uh, um, preferences that I want to go here or, or I, I mean I do apply for a specific um, mm, for a specific mission or or I just sign up I want I want to go and uh, you will actually offer me something when you have something and it's for me to take it or leave it or, or uh, I think that that's probably like um more of an exception than a rule. There may be places where there are quite a lot of gaps and then you might be be lucky to have a place. Um, and definitely that's something which happens when you have more experience mm. because when you have more experience, then you're well known, people know, okay, like you do a good job and then they're wanting to retain you within the organization. So it's mm. also in their interest to do that. But generally for your first mission, you kind of go where you're, you're offered. But there's definitely yeah. circumstances where someone is like, this is my background. I yeah. have um, experience working in this country where then they think, well, it's, it's really uh, would be a benefit to have you there. Mm -hmm. And so. you do have missions like all over the world or? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it depends on the different offices, like where you have missions. But um, for example, there's some in South America. You have some in Asia. There was even a project here in Sweden um, for asylum seekers. So you have them all over and you have um, also like the Mediterranean, you probably know from then um, migrants um, coming along. So it's it we're all over. It's where the need is. But then, of course, then uh, we have to prioritize because the needs are so great. Yeah. But it changes all of the time. OK, thank you. No worries. Workless or worthless? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, aside from um, spending time eating cheese and yeah, catching up on TV shows and hanging out with friends, then yeah, as a showering, yeah, definitely needed. Um, it, it depends a little bit. Like, so for me, I've been working with MSF, and then when I've gone to the field and I've quit my position to then go maybe then if you have a job which then gives you then uh, the chance to to leave then you can go back to that that's not as common for non-medical people generally if you're medical it's a bit easier than to be granted leave and also if you're medical you tend to get shorter missions um so yeah most people i would say don't have a job when they go come straight back but also you're probably quite thankful of it you know catch up on sleep uh, rest um, have a bit of a break and then people will go out again so yeah you're you're not employed still when you go back you are employed yeah